since we haven't done a locus of a line in a while, folks, we're gonna give you a two for one offer. Not just one class 20, but two. Here at the Watkiss line, we are fortunate not to have one class 20, but two of them. So to give us a tour around, look at the inside and out, and also what it looks like in the cab, let's hand over to our operations manager. Over to you, Richard. Okay, um, so we'll give you a little bit of detail uh, about the class 20s. We've got two based on the, on the Watercrest line at the moment. Uh, D8059 behind us here, which became 20059 in uh, tops, tops numbers. And uh, uh, D8118, which became 2118. Um, we're lucky actually to have one of the new type and one of the old type. Um, sounds a little bit daft talking about an engine that's 60, 60 years old, uh, but they were built in specific batches. Um, the first batch was D8000 to 8019. They were built in 1957. Uh, British Rail asked for uh, diesel types to replace steam. Uh, and the English Electric Company had on their drawing board a, a, a design which I think was based originally for West Africa. Um, so they already had these on the drawing board. They produced uh, the first 20 of them in uh, 1957 um, and were so successful that British Rail Board then uh, basically ordered another 108. Um, this 59 here is one of the 108 that were delivered. This one was built in 1961. It was originally classed as an English Electric Type 1. So the, the, the diesel locomotives were classed in type one, two, three, four, and five, based on the power output. The, these are nominally a thousand horsepower, so a fairly low horsepower loco. Um, during the modernization plan, everything was going fairly badly. The, the, the BR board was spending money on things without any real prototypes. Uh, anything with a Paxman engine was, it was struggling. Anything built by North British was struggling. As a result, the BR board then decided to order another hundred so they were built, basically built in three batches. Um, the giveaway for the early batches is the Headco discs. Um, as much like the old steam technology, they've all got sort of white discs to show the type of head code that's currently showing a light engine head code. So the, basically the first um, 128 would have discs on the front. What they call the new locomotives, uh, like D188, had the root indicator with the blinds, the four digit 1M33 head code box to do away with the discs. And that's the, one of the easiest ways of identifying the, the new locos from the old. There's quite a few other little subtle differences, but uh, that's, that's the real standout thing. As they were going away from, uh, from the disc and the, and the lamp and root head codes to the, to the later, which we currently still use on, uh, on, on the network as it stands at the moment. This was built 1961, this is 59, and 188 was built 1966. So as I say, there's actually a few years between them. But, um, but as I say, we, ironically, we still call them the new and the old type, which is, uh, bearing in mind, the newest was 1966. It's a bit, uh, a bit bonkers. Um, so that's primarily the history of them. They, they worked in service from, effectively, from 1957 uh, right through. In fact, they're still in service on the big railway today. Uh, there's still probably a six or seven that are network rail registered. Uh, this one was withdrawn, I think, 2003. So uh, a fairly good investment for 1961. Um, they probably had them, you know, if you built 12, 12 months after Evening Star that worked for five years, this one ran for the best part of 50, so not a bad investment, just about squeezed the money's worth out of it. Uh, just while I'm here, there's an interesting thing with the early, early batch, talking of the batches. Uh, the original batches, you just about make out a cutout on the, on the buffer beam, were equipped with steam heat pipes. Uh, never had a boiler, never had any means of creating steam heat but they were built with a through pipe. So if there was a steam engine on the front, they could pipe it through the diesel into the coaches behind. So uh, some of the early photos, you'll see the steam heat pipe and a cock on the front. It was just purely to, to pass it through the bottom of the loco. So uh, we'll carry on round and I'll, uh, I'll show you a little bit about the layout of the loco and the, and the power unit as, as we go. Okay, so up in the cab, um, this is the number one desk. It's an, an, a very unusual layout, the class 20 because it's a single cab design, which is fairly unique. They've only the very early uh, modernization plan locos had single cabs, um, primarily based on a steam design, really, where it was always a driver and fireman. So there was always somebody to look out along the, along the side of the engine. So the door is on a staggered basis. So it's always in the sort of behind the desk, if you like. Um, so what we're looking at here is number one desk, 
which is nearest the power unit. The, the nose end is the front. The cab is at the back. Um, this is the master desk. All the electrical equipment is under this desk. The desk in the corner is purely a slave desk. It's, the, the controllers are linked under the floor, but they are, um, as I say, there's no electrical equipment under that desk other than uh, a, few light, a few light switches. Um, so the basic layout is we've got a, a, a master controller, which is, which, which is locked by a key. Uh, and, that, and that releases the, releases the handle. Uh, that then releases the master controller, uh, which, which is basically your power handle. So we've got off, engine only, forward and reverse on the master controller. And then the power handle is, is basically the demand then on the power for the loco to increase power and, and ultimately to increase speed. Um, and then not, there's no numbers on it. It's just basically off right the way through to full power. Typical English electric, fairly basic. Left hand side of the desk is the auto brake. So that's the vacuum brake or the, or the air brake on the train that works the brakes on the train throughout. Uh, it also works the brakes on the loco proportionally to, to the to the brake braking on the train. There's also a brake valve there. It's called the straight air brake or direct uh, direct brake, which is purely low work in the loco brakes on the bogies themselves. So you can hold the train by the loco brakes with all the train brakes released. Uh, and then we've got a set of fault lights. Uh, we've got an engine stopped, wheel slip and fault. That just obviously does what it says on the tin, gives you a bit of an idea. All the more important when you've got two or three working in multiple because that will also indicate what the other two engines are doing at the same time. So your one might be running, but the two behind you uh, would, would flag up if an engine stopped somewhere. Working across the top then, we've got various brake gauges, vacuum brakes, the bogey pressures, so how much brakes being applied on the, on the, uh, on the locomotive itself, uh, the air brake train pipe in the middle, and then we've got the air supply on the loco, how much is in the main reservoir, how much the compressors have generated, how much is stored and available. Uh, we then got the speedometer. Th these are originally 75 mile an hour uh, when they were you know, in service, which is more than a bit lively. They were later reduced to 60. Um, and as you'll see later on with some of the suspension on these, they're all like a cart horse. So it's, uh, it's a bit like sort of pram springs under them. So they're a little bit lively at speed. Uh, the ammeter, which is basically showing how much current is being drawn from the, from the main generator to the motors. So that's important for with a, with a diesel electric to shut the power off with as little power being drawn as possible to save the contactors flashing and, and having a you know doing themselves some damage and then the last one there in the corner is a, is a slow speed speedo so basically these primarily towards the end of their life spent a lot of their time doing merry-go-round trains which was you know mgr trains effectively loading coal where the train never actually stopped um, take it to the power station and discharge it without stopping. So it would load in through the top from conveyor belts, drop out the bottom of the wagons at the power station. The locos only ever really stopped for fuel, brake blocking or crew changes. So there's some switches up on the desk here and I've got a selection here, 0.5 mile an hour, 1 mile an hour, 2.7 mile an hour. And you'd set that to whatever the discharge speed was of the power station, open the controller to a set amount and it would just sit there and sort itself out and she'd just toddle away through with the other loco and pull the rake of HAA wagons through the power station, discharging this to the, uh, the coal as it went. So quite way ahead of its time, actually, and fundamentally, most of the work disappeared with the coal industry. That's, that's really where a lot of these locos disappeared. And then above the, above the window there is the, is the marker lights. Um, I've got all the, basically all the lights that are on the nose end are controlled by this panel here. So I've got three, three lights for each disc across the bottom one at the top in the middle and two red lights for tail lights and then a, and then a basically a desk light and a cab light above there that's duplicated over the other side for the for the uh, cab end of the loco and then in the cupboard there is basically some of the fuse equipment the fuse tester some of the some of the cutout switches uh, and some of the relays fire alarm relays and, and so on and so forth so that's uh, that's the noise you don't want to hear other than when you press the test button uh, right, so on the side of the framing, yet again, as unusual design in the sense because it's single cabbed, there's effectively a running plate. So it is very much like a boiler on a steam locomotive, handrail at the top. Um, and as I say, you've just got to be a bit, have your wits about you when you're working up here. And most times you go in an engine room on a diesel, you go in through a door into the, into the engine room from the cab, you're within the box all the time. So, uh, so as I say, pretty unusual. Um, going along, basically, there's a, 
it's a bit like an advent calendar. There's a surprise behind every door. I'll work my way along the, uh, along the side here and uh, show you around. Originally, in the early days, these had ladders to get up onto the roof to access the radiator fan. Um, with electrification going on, the 25,000 volt AC, they were pretty quick to be taken off. So that's, that's a sort of a preservation area refit. Um, the, uh, the British Rail took them away pretty, pretty quickly uh, when the uh, overhead lines or flashes started to come in. Okay, so in the nose end, uh, effectively we've got quite a bit of equipment in here. Uh, we've got a traction motor blower. Because the, elect the electric motors are working quite hard, particularly at low speed when the engines are working at their hardest, they need a lot of forced air just to, to keep them cool. So the, this one's got a, a, a blower motor at either end, basically forces cool air through a set of bellows to the bogey, blows air through the, all the electrical equipment on the motor, just keeps it, keeps it nice and cool. Also in here, we've got a, a compressor, which produces all the compressed air for the locomotive. So all the brakes are operated by compressed air. We've got regulating air, control air, all manner of other things. That's all produced from here and stored in air tanks, which are underneath the locomotive. We've also got an exhauster, which is, creates the vacuum for the, for the brakes on the, on the older, older vehicles. Nearly all of our coaches are, 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 uh, are vacuum braked, so that's, that's important. And we've also got a header tank in the roof, which is basically the overflow, if you like, the extra water for the coolant for the, for the power unit. Coolant on these is used in radiators in the, in the grills just behind us. And that's used to cool not only the engine water, but also the oil, keeps the oil nice and cool. Coming forward to these ones, uh, we've got the, basically the oil pump, the fuel pump, oil filters, fuel filters, all the ancillary bits and pieces to do with the sort of the power unit. So this is where really the, the, sort, of the, 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 the sort of the bits and pieces to, that feed the engine are. It's also where the header tank feeds into the cooler group supply. We've then got the end of the engine. There's a drive shaft goes through the middle of the unit here which drives the fan above the radiator. So basically the, the fan spins, draws cool air in through the, through the fins and exhausts hot air up through the top. And then the next one along, start to see the, the side of the English electric V8. Now each one's got its own independent head um, and there's covers at the top here for accessing the cylinder heads up top. So as I say, so you can individually take a head off, uh, replace rocker gear, get to any bits and pieces, injectors, pumps. Uh, fuel pumps are behind these panels, injectors and so on are in the top. Um, and it's basically laid in a V formation. So it's a single crankshaft with uh, piston rods coming off in a V for this side, for the other side. And that leads on to this, this compartment, which is where the start of the main generator is. And we've got some instrumentation here. We've got a, uh, an oil pressure gauge and then there's a boost pressure for both of the turbos. This has got two turbos on the end of it, and that's what gives the engines the characteristic whistle, um, love it or loathe it. And that's where there's two Napier, Napier turbos that give it the whistle, and they feed up to just here where the two exhausts are. So very much like the engine in a V, you get the two exhausts up, up at the top. Um, main generator at the bottom is a big DC generator. Um, to start the power unit, uh, we use batteries from underneath to spin the generator as a motor. That turns the engine over to a point where it fires. Once the engine's fired, the system then changes over and this then becomes a generator. And that provides the DC current for the four traction motors, one on each axle. There's also, on the, on the rear of this, is a, an auxiliary generator, which is produced then for battery charging, lighting, all, all the auxiliary bits and pieces. Uh, so the, tra the main generator is purely for traction power and starting auxiliary generator for the rest of the bits and pieces. So I've wandered along the outside now. I've uh, got sandboxes for dropping sand, obviously for wet and, and, and greasy rails. Uh, we've got the first of the brake cylinders. That's actually the air cylinder that applies the brakes onto the loco. So as we saw in the cab, the bogey pressures, that's basically what's happening on this bogey. Uh, on the end of the axle box, these are all roller bearings. There's a, a mileometer. And she's probably been to the moon and back two or three times, this old girl, I should think. But that's, that's a, a way of keeping a tab on the mileage. So when we're pre preparing the engine, we'd look around and make sure, looking at checking the springs, brake, brake blocks, making sure everything's as it should be. We've got the primary and secondary spring in. These have shows the old design. These have got the fairly early sets of uh, uh, leaf springs, which are sort of, you know, like a, almost like a pram springs on there, which gives them the fairly lively, lively ride. 
Uh, working along, we've got the emergency fire pull there. If an emergency, break the glass, pull the handle, that'll fire the CO2 bottles into the engine, engine bay and basically douse, douse the fire, which takes all the oxygen away effectively and puts the fire out. Not somewhere you want to be when they go off. It's all very nice being in Phantom of the Opera, but not for me. Uh, fuel filler point. Uh, the fuel tank on these is basically built into the chassis. So there's a, there's a gauge on there showing in litres and gallons. And basically in, in this part of the framework is where the fuel is held. Fairly low because of the design, it's only about 400 gallons. So it's a, it's a fairly small tank as opposed to the 50 that holds over 1,000 gallons. In the middle here is the battery boxes. Obviously it takes a fair bit of power to start an engine like this. So there's two banks of batteries, one this side and one the other uh, with a switch to cut them out uh, overnight. In behind there are the air tanks for the air reservoirs and uh, all the timing reservoirs and so on. Um, various filler cocks for oil, water, coolant and everything else that we can fill up from down here. Um, top up the system, even the header tank up the top. And then another bogey exactly the same as the previous one. Just check in, make sure everything looks in order, brake gear, brake cylinders, no pipe work, nothing leaking. Um, and, and just predominantly a visual inspection really. Uh, roller bearings throughout, and as I say, these are unusual in having two, two speedo heads. They're, they're actually there's one this side, one the other. The, the main speedometer is driven off the one nearest the cab. But as we said earlier, this had a slow speed speedometer for merry-go-round working. So they had a se separate probe on a different axle for the, for the slow speed. Um, and that really takes us to the end of the loco. We do this, we normally work in a sort of a, a, a regular pattern, start in one corner, work the way around, right the way around, make sure everything's in order for a startup. Uh, but that's as far as we can go on this one. Uh, what we do now, uh, 188 is just up the sidings here, which is one of the new type. Uh, we'll have a wander up to that and uh, go and have a look at a couple of the differences. Okay then, so we've come up to um, 188, the, uh, the, one of the new locomotives, as you can tell by the route indicator instead of the discs. A little bit about the front end detail, uh, the various, it's quite a, compared to a steam locomotive for example, there's an awful lot of uh, bits and pieces on the front here, it looks hideously complicated. I'll, I'll have a, bit of a run through what that's all about. Um, first and foremost, there's a blue star that appears on the, on the buffer beam and that basically determines what type of coupling uh, system it's operating with and, and um, basically that's electro-pneumatic is what it stands for. There were varying types, Blue Star covered class 20, uh, 33, 37, 25, 26, 27. Um, and so basically all of those were able to be coupled in multiple and operate up to three locomotives of any type with one driver. So it makes a massive difference. So whereas hideously before you'd have needed a driver for each locomotive, you can run up to three from one driving desk and effectively three of these together, 3000 horsepower, you're up to a Deltic virtually, you know. Um, and, and basically I'll, I'll have a run through the system on the front here. Obviously behind the standard draw gear we've got two buffers and a, a coupling with a, with a shackle, exactly as you'd find on a steam engine. Uh, so working across then we've got the yellow pipe here, which is the main reservoir pipe. That supplies compressed air from the leading locomotive to any other coupled together, be it they're running or not. Uh, and that's normally around about 100 psi of air. We've got the regulating air, which is the white one. Uh, basically that's what comes from the power handle in the cab that's what spins up the governor to open the fuel racks on the engine and basically rev up the engine um, so when we're driving from another desk that coupled together with the valves open would supply the air to the to the second loco or the third loco uh, we've got a, a multiple working jumper socket um, which is which is basically the female part of the of the system there's a, a corresponding jumper cable uh, that hangs down on that side. So on this locomotive it could be plugged into from 59 or we could use this one to plug into 59 e either way. It's one or the other, it doesn't have to be both. Vacuum hose as you'd find on the steam, as, exactly as we'd expect. Um, and then we've got a duplicate set on this side. There's another white one and another yellow one so we can use either side, they do both the same. Uh, the red one though is the air brake pipe. So that's the for working air brake trains, which runs at compressed air, 72 and a half PSI of air. So uh, all with sort of uh, valves that, that close off. And then corresponding with the jumper socket for the uh, multiple working, that's the uh, end of the lead, which comes up to this side, uh, which undoes. 
and it hangs down and there's there's your pins in the end that would that would come forward and then plug into the corresponding socket on the other loco and that does all the electrical signals from the power controller to match in with the air messages being sent through the white pipe and and that's basically when the two are working together what what re re powers up the uh, traction motors from the from the leading loco rings the fire bell start and stop all all manner of things very very clever system um bear in mind this came in in 1957 um and realistically it's still in use to this day you know into modern traction with modern trains they don't actually have to necessarily couple any of this up manually underneath it's all done uh from cab level by pressing a button but the same principles apply um very very clever system there's several other systems that are around blue star is the most common um, there was also orange square which was class 50 they could only work in multiple with each other uh, there was red diamond which was class 56s 58s they could work in multiple with each other but nothing else uh, but so blue star is probably the most common common version of it but very clever system and as i say the only difference you do when you bring the two together you basically shut the desks down you can leave the engines running but you take your keys off so that there's no signals of anything trying to do anything no compressors running everything's calmed down electrically and then you go in and then methodically work your way through coupling everything up with the coupling first to make sure that when you finish off you don't pull all the spaghetti out the front and then basically work your way through till you till you come out and then you've basically got a test that both are working they're both trying to go in the same direction which is always helpful um, and do a power test and a brake test to make sure that everything's talking to each other but uh, as you may have seen recently we paired them up uh, for the open weekend it's the first time they've been together as a pair probably for four or five years um, a bit unnecessary for what we need power wise because that then gives us 2000 horsepower but it's nice to be able to show it off a little bit it, it sort of raises a few eyebrows and it uh, all a little bit of railway history kept 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 alive um, so that's a little bit about the, the two class 20s they do a fair bit of work here often behind the scenes come out if we're uh, having problems if we've got failures short short notice stuff and on special days and bits and pieces but uh, quite a bit of history even you know as I say for what's seen as a fairly modern thing they're, you know they're knocking on 60 years old in their own right uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of background and hope that's been interesting I shall admit before I started this episode I did not realize a how much history was involved in these and also that these workhorses are still in service to this very day that is the definition of an investment paying for itself so there you are guys many of you asked for a class 20s episode and here's a two for one offer thank you so much for watching thank you to richard for showing us around and we'll see you next time